Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm very glad to be here. Yes, what is Future ICT about? Uh, amongst other things, it's going to address 21st century challenges, tries to make a contribution to create more resilient and sustainable systems. And today's talk is about modeling and simulation, as was uh, already indicated, and its relevance for understanding crime. We've been talking a lot about big data, machine learning, data mining, all these kind of things. So my focus will be a little bit different, complementary somehow, to give a social science and a complexity science perspective. So we have a number of old problems that uh, are still basically threatening us, uh, such as terrorism, but also wars in many countries of the world. I'd like to point out that somehow we have a new kind of problem that we are facing, which is basically a self-destabilization of society and economic systems. And uh, so uh, we don't need tanks anymore, actually, to rob other countries. You can do it uh, from the trading desk. And that is somehow changing the situation. I'm a bit surprised nobody has been talking about the financial war so far. It's certainly something that we need to be aware of, that things are going on there that uh, are getting out of control. And the question is, why is that, actually? It's not only myself uh, who thinks that systems are getting out of control. For example, Sandy Pendant of the MIT Media Lab has uh, spoken quite frankly that our financial transportation and health systems are broken. And this has something to do actually with our globalization and the technological change that we have seen in the past years. I'm not against globalization or technological change, by the way, but we have to recognize that this has changed our world. We now have a global exchange of people, money, goods, and information, and that has implications. We have created all sorts of networks. We have made everything interdependent, and these kinds of infrastructures and networks not only facilitate new services, which we are very happy about, and create new opportunities, but also the same, very same infrastructure can create pathways for disaster spreading, such as uh, the failed financial crisis or global terrorism, um, global environmental change, organized crime, cyber crime, and so on. We're even talking about cyber war now. And so there are quite a number of challenges that have global scale now. Now, Future ICT wants to address these issues. And the plan is basically to bring together data, models, and people. And so we want to create new instruments to get better insights into complex systems. We want to address questions like, what is the state of the world, if possible, in real time and globally? And not only looking at, actually, the physical state of the world and biological conditions, but also the economic and social conditions. So for this, we need to create systems to sense and understand with the purpose to turn data into information. And further on, we want to create models that allow us to simulate and to predict, even though only in a probabilistic way, and maybe only predict on a short time scale. But anyway, it will help us uh, to respond adaptively to upcoming situations better than we can do it today. And we want to have a look at what if scenarios. Also, we want to turn information into knowledge. But not only this, also we want to turn knowledge into wisdom. So what are we doing this for? For the people, of course. So we want to make these new instruments and tools available for everybody. Let me go into more detail. Before I do that, however, let me point out that also, an innovation accelerator is needed in order to keep up with the pace at which new problems are emerging, but also new opportunities are coming up. And we are creating this innovation accelerator 
by integrating activities of different scientific fields that have been working in separation in the past, which is in particular information communication technology and social sciences and complexity science. Now let me explain a little bit more about the planetary nervous system. How can we imagine that it would work? Just assume this situation over here. A colleague of mine has basically taken Flickr photos, and from these Flickr photos, he actually managed to reconstruct Rome, or at least the, the interesting parts of Rome, within a single day of computing. So he basically determined where those photographs were taken. This is the Colosseum over here, and then after about 23 hours, I think, yes, here we go. <laughs> a three-dimensional reconstruction of the Coliseum, yeah? Without any traffic jams, without any waiting at the airport and so on. So really, we can get the world into our living room with data which are just out there. And there will be more data. Smartphones will collect data for us. Uh, but we should do it in a way that is privacy respecting, which gives users control over their own data and also allows them to basically participate in the economic profits generated from those data. So there are a number of technological, but also ethical and societal um, questions that need to be addressed in order to come up with systems which would really fit into our society well. Because we need to be aware that those technologies will change our society and we don't want it to happen in a way that is uncontrollable. We want to decide how our society evolves. Now, the Living Earth Simulator goes a step further. It's not just measuring the state of the world. It's going to simulate. And uh, basically, what we are, have to do is to get many heterogeneous models together, such as traffic models, models for production, economic systems, crowd behavior, social cooperation, norms, conflict, crime, war, and so on. Then we have to scale them up to global scale and eventually increase the degree of detail, the accuracy, and that, of course, requires a lot of data, and those data will come from the planetary nervous system that I described just before. Here is an example where colleagues of mine, Alex Vespignani and others, have simulated epidemic spreading. But in contrast to previous models, those models take into account spatial temporal dependencies, and in particular, mobility. The global airline traffic is very important to understand the quick spreading of emerging diseases. And these kinds of simulations are now being used, actually, to give advice to decision makers in order to take effective steps towards reducing the number of infected people or the number of victims of such diseases. And as I said, all of this should uh, eventually become available for everybody, such as Wikipedia. So we want to create a global participatory platform. And the challenge is really to make it open, but in a way that it wouldn't be misused, because creating a new public good will come with the classical problems associated with public goods. That means they could be exploited or misused. They could be data pollution, manipulation, privacy intrusion, cybercrime, and many other things. Of course, we don't want this to happen, so we need to think about ways to promote responsible use, and that requires transparency, accountability, reputation systems, and many other tricks that uh, basically would uh, keep the potential of misuse down to a low level and uh, create much more benefits than problems. OK, but that is a scientific challenge that needs to be addressed in order to be able to open up those data and models for everybody. And in fact, uh, we want to create this open world of modeling and data 
in order to unleash the power of the new data for new businesses, self-employment and uh, govern uh, governments and non-government institutions. And we can even go a step further and say, hey, why don't we create virtual worlds? We could uh, build copies of our planet with artificial societies. And in fact, in these different copies, we could change details, such as the voting system, the financial architecture, the intellectual property rights, or whatsoever. And we could use it as an experimental platform to find out what would people do under these conditions, because it's the institutional settings and the interactions that determine the outcome. But we could also create new spaces for people's social and economic activities. In some sense, you and me, we all could choose the world we like, the virtual world, of course. So somehow we're, to a certain extent, overcoming now the limitations of our material world in the information world. Now, all of these different functionalities, that means basically the data, the modeling, and the interactiveness will come together in what we call the observatories and the exploratories. And in particular, there will be some that address uh, the issue of conflict and war, but also crime and corruption. I think this is what is of particular interest for you today. So, of course, data can be collected about all these events. It will be very important to get a better understanding. And I'll come back to this later on when I talk about Jerusalem and the Middle Eastern conflict. I guess what you wanted uh, to learn about today, I probably have all already seen quite a few talks about it, is uh, to look at uh, what network science can do actually in order to determine criminal networks and criminals and uh, basically try to destroy these networks in a targeted way. And of course, there have been publications about terrorists, about street gangs, about truck networks, and so on. And this is all very useful. And Future ICT will certainly be able to make a contribution to this as well. But I'd like uh, to point out this is just part of the problem. And uh, I'd like you to think out of the box today. Yeah? And for this, I'd like to remind you of Galileo Galileo, who has really challenged our way of thinking. Oh, he has claimed that all the bodies in the world, no matter whether it's small or big, would fall at the same speed. And who thinks that this is really true? Nobody thinks this? Ah, OK, just a few. Uh, I'll make this experiment for you, OK? So I drop both objects at the same time. I'll see which one is faster. <laughs> well, poor Galileo Galilei. Huh? So why did the Catholic Church put him to prison then? You know? And why did it take 350 years for the Catholic Church to apologize for this? What is wrong? Was he a criminal? Was he stupid? Was he too intelligent? So what was happening here? Now, well, this guy was looking behind what his senses told him. And he understood that if you could abstract from the effect of air resistance, so this is just loosely on top of this other object now, this would basically change everything. Okay. Now, this insight was so dramatic that it really changed our way of thinking about our world. It changed our geocentric perspective to a heliocentric perspective. And uh, the Catholic Church felt challenged, but it was also the start of modern physics. And now we can shoot satellites into the universe and do a lot of wonderful things with our modern physics. Well. I'm asking you to challenge your thinking in the same way. Because our thinking determines what we see. 
take this catch, which was raised in this box with vertical bars. So this is the wall she knows. Uh, if you put, would put it into a different box like this one after some months, it couldn't see those horizontal bars. Of course, the cognition was built for a different world. And what I claim is we need to overcome the limitations of our conventional thinking to understand the systemic nature of problems. I'm saying this because I'm often making this experience with journalists. I'm trying to explain what complex systems are about, and it turns out that it's very difficult to understand. I'm talking in particular about strongly coupled complex systems, which are not only characterized by a faster dynamics, but also in particular by self-organization. So this is very important to recognize because loosely coupled systems, so if you have different objects basically, these are characterized by the properties of the different system components. So the system behavior is the sum of its component characteristics. However, in strongly coupled systems, interactions take over. Self-organization takes place. We have, in many cases, emergent new system properties. And these can often be counterintuitive. And there can be unwanted feedback cascade and side effects that we need to understand in order to get a better idea of the problems we are facing. If you couldn't solve a certain problem, then maybe because we have seen it in the wrong way. We need to think out of the box to find new solutions. Well, those problems also, complex systems, are characterized by a low level of predictability, low level of control, or difficulties to control them, and crime certainty belongs to those problems. And there can be actually extreme events of any size. And these are all quite familiar problems of many of the world's challenges that we know. So most likely, they're a result of complex systems. Now, as I said, we need to change our perspective from a component-oriented view to an interaction-oriented view. Unfortunately, the interactions are hard to see, actually, hard to measure. So it's really difficult to turn our eyes and our senses away from what we automatically see towards what we don't see. But it's needed to understand the nature of complex systems. As I said, extreme events are quite common, and they're a result often of cascading effects. And I often use this example over here to demonstrate that. So these are table tennis balls on top of mouse traps. And you will see that we will drop just one table tennis ball. So there's a local perturbation. <laughs> yeah, you find this funny, but this. <laughs> This is an experiment which has been created to demonstrate how nuclear power stations work or how they get out of control. <laughs> yeah. So this shows you actually that these strongly coupled systems are really hard to control. So when I was starting to think about strongly coupled systems and their different nature, I was starting to wonder, as we have created these strongly networked systems in our world, have we maybe inadvertently created a global time bomb? Well, that sounds like a science fiction almost, yeah? And in the beginning, really, I was not sure about it. I was scared about this idea. I said, OK, don't think about it. Um, but then I thought it was so serious that I should follow it up, OK? And this is what I found, actually, on the web. Warren Buffett, one of the richest persons in the world, he said that um, we are building financial weapons of mass destruction. He was warning of an investment time bomb and of mega catastrophic risk for the economy. That was in 2003. 
and five years later, the bomb has exploded. We know that. So have we created uncontrollable system where is it just a matter of time until they explode? Well, maybe, uh, certainly we need to think about it. Here the flash crash illustrates the instability of those systems quite well. Within 20 minutes, $600 billion were evaporated. So solid assets turned into penny stocks within minutes. That means the ownership structure of a whole company could change within minutes. And it turns out, in contrast to what people saw at the beginning, it was not a criminal act. It was not an error. It was an interaction effect. And here is another cascading effect which shows how dramatic the situation has actually been. So Lehman Brothers defaulted, and then that caused actually the, the bankruptcy of hundreds of banks. It looks, looks like a thunderstorm or like this example actually with our table tennis balls. This is not so funny anymore, right? <laughs> Yeah. Now, I've been trying to think more about this system and assume, okay, let's assume that uh, an economic system is based on exchange and you can be either honest or you can trick somebody, okay? I heard that sometimes happens, yeah. And uh, so, if somebody is honest, uh, we call him cooperative. If he's dishonest and tricking somebody, we call this defective. And now we're simulating a situation where, say, banks are collaborating with neighboring banks, or, say, regional banking system. Um, and you can see that this neighborhood interaction over time actually promotes blue behavior, which means honest behavior. Yeah. This is how the model is set up. And then now we start to network the system globally. That means now banks start to have interactions with more and more banks. And very unfortunately, while in the beginning networking is good, in the end it makes the whole system break down. This is something that we wouldn't expect. Yeah? You think, okay. Networking works fine, let's do more networking. That's even better, so let's network even more. And then suddenly you get to this tipping point where your whole system collapses. Well, that should be a warning to us, actually. And I'd like to show this letter to the Queen of England. You have a really very intelligent queen, you know. Well, she's supposed to do a representative job. She's asking very intelligent questions. Uh, so this one, for example, why had nobody noticed that the credit crunch was on its way? And scientists were so surprised about it that they couldn't answer it right away. Instead, the British Academy had a workshop on this and then they send a letter to the Queen summarizing the outcome of this workshop. And so what was said is everyone seemed to be doing their own job properly on its own merit. And they were doing it often well. However, the failure was to see how collectively this added up to a series of interconnected imbalances over which no single authority had jurisdiction. Individual risk may rightly have been viewed as small, but the risk to the system as a whole was vast. And I like this formula in the end. We have the <laughs> honor to remain, Madam, Your Majesty's most humble and obedient servants. Yeah. Who feels like this as well? Oh, wonderful. I love it. OK. So basically, what is written here in words is describing a situation that in science we call systemic instability. That is a situation where even if everybody was trying hard to do the best thing, things would go wrong sooner or later. Let me give you another example which makes it more clear. Here we have cars driving in a circle 
And the task is uh, to drive continuously, but avoid accidents, of course. We'll see that eventually drivers will fail. There will be a perturbation. Traffic jam has formed. Cars are stopped. Traffic jam is moving backward. And you don't get rid of this problem anymore. OK. If you would ask a driver, OK, why has this happened? The driver would say, there was a stupid driver in front of me who didn't know how to drive. Yeah? You've heard yourself saying that as well. Yeah? Now, the issue, however, is this is a systemic instability. So sooner or later, no matter how hard drivers will try and how well they are trained, they will fail. And here's another example. While pedestrians are usually self-organizing in a wonderful way, you can see these lanes of uniform walking direction, very little <laughs> obstructions, actually. So uh, invisible hand kind of self-organization, just as Adam Smith suggested it for the economy. It turns out that this invisible hand self-organization, unfortunately, breaks down when you challenge the system, when the density is too high. And here's a very sad example of the love parade in Duisburg, where a crowd disaster happened. 21 people died. More than 500 were injured. Of course, nobody wanted to kill anybody. Everybody wanted just the opposite. But 21 people died. How could that happen? And in fact, it's not yet fully cleared up. In the first moments, people thought there was a bomb explosion. And then, of course, it turned out it was not a bomb explosion. But then they thought, OK, uh, people have fallen down here. There is a small staircase on the people. But that was also not the reason. And people said, OK, the crowd went mad, basically. There was a stampede. Now, all of this is not true. Actually, this is the explanation. Oh, the public wants to put somebody to, into prison. Now, whom to put into prison here? It turns out, actually, that basically everybody was causally involved in this accident. There was a systemic instability, and the mistake was that the interactions were designed in a way, involuntarily, of course, that this could happen. But there are more systemic instabilities. Now, many of the problems in the world where things get out of control are of this nature. Wars, revolutions. And I would claim that it's not a single person, basically, that usually goes to war or that uh, starts a revolution. I think this is the wrong way of seeing things. A single person can only make a difference when the system is already insta unstable. And it doesn't matter so much what is the name of the person. There are even some revolutions, actually, where you could not even identify a leader. That was very surprising, actually, for the NATO when there's, uh, I think, in Tunisia, no, not Tunisia, but I'm saying Libya. Um, in the beginning, you could not say, OK, who is the leader of this revolution? So it's uh, self-organization, it's instability, and this is very important to recognize. It was dubbed as a Twitter revolution and a Facebook revolution, but is this really true? I claim it was not. Maybe this information acted like a catalyst, but it was not the course of the revolution. You can see that quite clearly over here. There are economic data, such as the GDP per person, but also social, societal data, such as the fertility, the number of children per woman, which basically determines whether a system is autocratic or democratic. So there is a typical transition line from one kind of organization of a society to another one. So these revolutions were overdue. 
they were about to happen. And by the way, a similar thing happened in Europe some decades back. It's a cascading effect as well, but the trigger actually turns out to be, in the case of the Arabic revolutions, the price of food. So there was a general instability that was related to those factories over here. And then there was a trigger that basically started off the situation. And Facebook and Twitter was not the course. It was just uh, something like a lubricant or a catalyst, as I say. What about Europe? In what situation are we? I've already pointed out some years ago that we had signs of social instability. I was thinking about the situation in Greece, in France, in Great Britain. We've seen it, of course, there were these riots in London. Everybody was extremely shocked. And it was even more shocking to learn that there were teachers, 14-year-olds, there were daughters of millionaires who somehow were among the rioters. How could that be? Are those criminals? Remember what I told you before. In a strongly coupled system, there are new behaviors. It's not the properties of the individual that matter. It's the interactions that take over. Self-organization, emergent phenomena. Yeah, when there is this riot, people change behavior. They don't need to be criminals in order to do such a thing. The question is, what is the proper response to that? A much more difficult question, but I don't want to anticipate an answer over here. Just want to say that. Those people who said we should shut down the internet and the social media, maybe you should think twice about it. Um, just remember, by the way, I think in Egypt, when um, the ministry tried to shut down the internet, I think the guy was put to prison in the end. And I think in the meantime, we know that shutting down the internet is not a good idea. And here's a good example of the positive side. So after the riot, there were really a lot of people who helped to clear up the mess. So how to understand this kind of behavior? I'm well, trying to get my own perspective on this. And I should say, I'm now turning more and more away from a kind of an official standpoint of future ICT towards my own social science thinking about these things. So if you don't like it, um, don't blame future ICT for it, OK? You could say, OK, this guy, Dirk, has just met the Dalai Lama, and that had some <laughs> impact on, on how he thinks about things, OK? But I'd like to stimulate just a little bit of discussion, OK? So I believe it's important to recognize that there are a number of incentive systems that drive people's behaviors. There's different ways of having pleasures, which is intellectual pleasure, emotional pleasure. And there's also kind of um, the ad adrenaline flash, yeah? And um, these uh, different incentive systems are controlled by different parts of the brain. And obviously, people have different weights on those different incentive systems. Yes? An intellectual maybe does not have any fun doing sports and go going to a party, while there are other people who love to do sports and don't care about books. It is very important to recognize we are not all the same. And now, if we have less satisfaction in one of those dimensions, then we would uh, try to compensate this by putting more weight on others. Now, what would happen in case of an uh, economically hard time when we don't get certain kinds of pleasures? Well, that would come down to putting more weight on these things, for example. That means more violence hooliganism, riots, extremism, and in the worst case, wars. This is concerning. And this is why we need to be very careful 
that we don't shift from here to there. Because very easily a society can destabilize. Culture is not a God-given thing. We need to protect it. It turns out, in fact, that uh, a lot of violence in London happened in those areas which uh, suffer of deprivation. But it's also important to recognize that it's not just poor economic conditions that cause dissatisfaction, but even more deterioration of it. So that means even now as countries which have a high level of income could destabilize if the situation deteriorates because people would get dissatisfied and extremism would come up. We can see that already in some countries in Europe. How does society work? I mean, this is an interesting question. And somehow there is this struggle between chaos and order. Yeah? We'd probably think, OK, chaos is a bad thing. But in fact, there are also good sides, uh, such as um, a, a lot of creativity and innovation comes out of what uh, appears to be chaotic. Um, but of course, many things that we are proud of in our <laughs> culture and uh, the progress of civilization is built on the order that we have managed to create. So we create synergy effects of all kinds of things. And, and one of the mechanisms to create order is social norms. And social norms basically are invisible forces that make people do certain things. They're the checks, the, the roles of our everyday behavior. We usually don't recognize these things. We could not even tell what are the norms. But in many cases, we just do it because we have learned to behave this way. But in principle, norms are based on san sanctioning and suppressing certain kinds of behavior that we dislike. That, however, can also create conflict. It turns out if you have a mixed population, I mean, say two ethnicities or two religions, then you don't have most conflict um, when you have a 50-50 mix. You have it over here, actually, where you have this transition between the situation of laissez-faire, where everybody, everybody lives as he likes, to a situation where one population suppresses the other. And that is somehow the phase transition point, the tipping point area, where basically the minority becomes strong enough to demand their own rights. Okay? But we couldn't, we shouldn't blame the minorities for this. I mean, if uh, we have a situation which is well enough balance and everybody is respectful to everybody else, then things work perfectly well. Where a good example is actually the conflict in the Middle East. We have data from Jerusalem. These allow us to make models about conflict. And we can understand the escalation dynamics that is seen over there. These models can also be used to compare different kinds of scenarios that are under political discussion and see what would most likely create more conflict or less conflict. So it's not just an issue that there are kind of bad guys who create a lot of mass and conflict. And, um, it's an issue of the interactions, again, of the institutional constraints of participation in government uh, decisions and so on. Well, a very interesting question is who decides what is right or wrong? Now, I feel that uh, many of you g get excited about all these data we now have, and we can hunt the criminals, you know. But who is a criminal? It was very interesting to read today on the newspaper um, a quote from a criminal officer of Munich, Josef Wilfing, who said, everyone can become a murderer. Most of the murders are committed by people who would never want to commit a murder. So we should be aware of this. So many cases of crime are a result of situations where things have gone terribly wrong, where people got off track. 
in a similar way as we have uh, seen these systemic instabilities before. So in the same way as we may blame the individuals for this, we may blame the situation. I'm not saying that there aren't people with bad intentions. Of course there are. But probably not the majority of people who commit crimes are, crimes are of this type. We also need to be aware that each new rule creates new rule violators. And the regulation density today is so high that not everyone knows all the rules, and probably everyone violates them. That's a very strange situation. And any classification also tends to create discrimination, false positives, and injustice. So keep that in mind. So just a question, a war on terror. Who thinks that um, these, these armies that gone to Iraq or uh, to Afghanistan were freedom fighters? Come on. No, no, the armies that we sent there. Nobody? Uh, that's scary. Uh, so here's another quote that I just learned, by the way. War is a downhill task. Peace is an uphill task. So it's really the challenge is peace. Uh, or what about the fall of the Berlin Wall? Was this a riot? Were these people that should have been blamed or put to prison? Or how do you think about it? It's very important to recognize also that there is an interrelationship between trust, authority, and legitimacy. Uh, there is here one example from Zurich, actually, where the migration office uh, was uh, blamed for improper behavior. And the result was that every few days, basically, the glass was <coughs> broken. Yeah? Once that situation was uh, discussed in the public and consequences were drawn, that has changed dramatically. And what about this? Is it for establishing safety, or is it for filling budget gaps? <laughs> well, is surveillance a good solution? I mean, obviously, now we, we have more and more opportunities to track people, to find out about uh, behaviors that we perceive as improper. Should we do that? Does the dream come true that we can catch all those criminals? Or will we end up with a situation where basically you put everybody to prison? <laughs> well, in the US, we have already 1% of citizens in prison. Eh? And it's, it's a business, actually. Yeah? Uh, I, I guess uh, there are even some prisons where you can buy stocks. So it's a business to put people to prison. Actually, it becomes possible now to single out minorities of all kinds. So if you have a certain political opinion and think, OK, people shouldn't do this, or people shouldn't do that, or a big company thinks people shouldn't do this, or people shouldn't do that, well, there is the technological possibility now uh, to put pressure on them, to single them out, to basically sue them in, or to, yeah, to bas basically design the society you like. This is quite scary. There is a totalitarian potential of these technologies. And we've seen in the past those people who thought they would have a vision of how, how society would look like. They have failed terribly. Yeah? These were usually the regimes where millions of people were dying in the end. So I think there is no single individual, no single company who knows what is good for society and could implement it. We need to be aware of this. We need to be aware that these technologies are changing our society. We don't know in which way, but we, we need to certainly look at the risk of manipulation, the risk of overconfidence, the risk of creating 
these virtual worlds, the filter bubbles that Ellie Pariser is talking about, and situations where those people who always are being confirmed what the internet, by what the internet tells them, whenever they meet real people again, there would be quite a high potential of conflict. So maybe rather than creating more harmony, this is going to create more conflict in society. So si privacy is important. Some people have said, OK, privacy, what do we need it for? What is it good for? If you don't have anything to hide, if you behave properly, so why should you be scared by a company or the internet recording everything? Well, it's because our norms are changing. If you're meeting, uh, eating meat today, maybe in five years, everybody thinks it's a crime to kill animals, you know? So everything can change, and if you behave properly today, it doesn't mean that this very same behavior will be considered proper tomorrow. Privacy somehow is the other side of the medal of the public. So the public can't work without privacy. Privacy can't work without public. So there are quite a number of reasons why privacy is needed. Society can't work without privacy. And I'd like to give you just this example from my childhood. I think my relationship to my parents was very much related to the fact that I could be sure that my parents would not open my diary. This established the basic of trust to my parents. And trust, on the other hand, is really crucial for the functioning of society. Once trust is breaking down, society is destabilizing. The breakdown of trust in the economy actually burned or basically evaporated thousands of billions of dollars. So trust is a very sensitive issue, and we need to be very careful about it. So I think I need to get towards the end. Um, I could tell much more about things, also how we can use self-organization actually to establish cooperation. We can use models to find out about why it's important to protect private property be beyond ideology. So there is a science behind it. Um, also, there's, uh, we can show that uh, a certain degree of social inequality is promoting cooperation as well. The question is how much inequality is good, how much inequality would not be good. I can't answer that, but maybe eventually we'll learn more about it. And we have also been learning about mechanisms that are st establishing moral behavior. And that, that is quite interesting. Unfortunately, time is running out. But there is also an interesting effect over here that I want to mention in the end, because it turns out that the spreading of moral behavior is accelerated when there are a few bad guys in the world that we can point our finger at. All right, so thank you very much for your interest. Thank you.